Okay, so I'm going to start. I want to thank you all for joining us today. And I am going to be talking about how to call for help both uh, within the home and from outside the home. Just a little bit about me. Um, I am mentioning several products today and I always like to tell my folks that I have no financial interest in the products I'm discussing. Um, I am an assistive technology professional. I've been with the ALS Association for 24 years now, I can see everybody. Um, and I've worked with the Greater Philadelphia chapter that whole time. And then the past uh, 10 years, I've been working with the National ALS Association. So I wanna talk obviously today about how to call for help. And um, for those of you that were with me last week, I apologize, you're gonna see some of the same slides because um, when you call for help, what does that mean in today's world? Well, it means something very different than it did even in January. So if you call for help right now, um, you have to be prepared to be alone in an ambulance and you have to be prepared to know that hospitals are not allowing anybody in the emergency room. So if you are a person with ALS or working with somebody with ALS who has trouble communicating, um, know that that person will not have a caregiver to be their interpreter. And so um, being prepared for that um, is, is priority. So I always, always recommend having a go bag, you know, um, a bag, any type of bag, you know, a backpack, which is like this, or just, a, a, you know, a duffel bag, and have your emergency information in there. Um, the most important thing that you can do is have it written down. All right, don't assume that the ER is going to have access to your cell phone or that they can dial in and um, especially if you pass pro word protect it, they're not going to be able to get in if you are non-communicative. So having things written down and the National ALS Association has packets that you can download right from their website and it has all the information in the packet that you need to write down like here's here's the page for insurance information or you know um what's your doctor's phone number um and it's all and all you have to do is write it out because you know uh, i i live and breathe off of my cell phone but if you ask me what my daughter's phone number is i'm going to tell you i don't know because <laughs> it's just saved in my favorites so having that that can be really crucial and then communication considerations, because this is my specialty, I always have to address this, that you can have letter boards in there, um, or you can have a piece of paper that says, Elisa says yes by, you know, looking to her right, no by looking to her left, and maybe by up. Or you have letter boards um, that are pictured below, and you can actually get free letter boards right now um, from patient provider communication. They have a whole section of their website devoted to COVID-19 and being able to communicate in the hospital. So that being said, when I talk about assistive technology, the most important crucial element that I talk about is how to call for help. You always, always have to have a way to call for attention. And so I ask people, you know, what is it that you need? Do you just need to alert someone in the house that you're uncomfortable, that you're in pain, or that you're thirsty, you're hungry? Or um, do you need to be able to reach 911? And if you're calling within the home, where are your caregivers? You know, are they in the home? Are they in the yard? Um, are they in a garage? So because there are interventions for and I would make recommendations for all those different things. So not one device is going to be able to to suit all your needs. Um, talking about what dexterity the user has and we'll go over that. Um, and if the user can still speak, just baby monitors are, are really a good intervention. And um, you know any type of bell, cowbell, 
uh, dinner chime bell, whatever, if they can still move their hand. So calling for systems within the home, electronic systems, they can be wired or wireless. Um, the wired device that you see here is called an easy call bell and alarm. And I have one here. I'm gonna move my screen back a little and show you. Okay, um, this is the bell and this is the alarm. It's run off of a nine volt battery in the back here. And you plug the unit in here. No, I'm not gonna plug it in right away, but I'm gonna show you that this um, bell can be placed anywhere on the body there's muscle movement. So if I was in bed here, and it has two clamps on the bottom back here. So I can clamp it to a pillow and I'm sleeping and I need something, I just go on and off. So it's very loud and you plug it in. Okay. Okay, and then you could, if they don't move at night, if they don't roll over, if they have chin movement, but you can basically put this wherever they have movement, on a foot, um, on an elbow, wherever they have movement. And it will stay on until the user gets off, okay? So that it alerts the caregiver that they need something. And I, I'm gonna unplug it so I don't accidentally shut it or set it off. And so, if you want, if you're using that, which is one of the most reliable systems on the market, but that your, if your caregiver is in another room, um, if they don't hear very well, or if they're sleeping on a different floor, you can use that in conjunction with baby monitors. So you put the monitor next to the bell here, or the alarm, and then wherever the caregiver is, they have their receiver, and they can hear that through the receiver. And, and you know, baby monitors have come a long way. So a lot of them even have video now so that you can look and see if there's a problem or if it was a true emergency or, or if it means do I get up or did he just accidentally um, depress the call bell. So you can use wireless door chimes. I have one right here. I got this at Walmart for $11.90. And here's the, the alarm part and so if the person with ALS can still depress the button you know they depress the button and it sets off the caregiver can carry this wherever they are so if they're like in the basement doing laundry they have this they have it on a shelf the patient presses the button and the caregiver knows they need something um, these come in a variety of different radiuses. Like this one's only a radius of 150 feet, but some of them come up to 400 feet. So you do want to know where you are in proximity to where the person who's gonna be pressing the button is. And then um, some of them have dual receivers. So if you, you put one on, you know, one on the second floor, one in the basement, and then some of them plug into an outlet. Um, so the ones that plug in the outlet, obviously you can't carry around from room to room, um, but they come in threes. So you could have one in the, you know, in the kitchen and one in the bedroom, and then maybe one in the basement. Whatever is going to work for you and the environment. So these are personal pagers, um, and they can be used from 40 to 100 feet away. And the nice thing about this one on the left here is that not only does it chime like you just heard that one do, but it vibrates. So you might have somebody who um, has difficulty hearing or might be resistant to wearing their um, hearing aids. Um, so they're obviously, they might not hear that chime. Or people who are outside you know, running a lawnmower, they're not gonna hear a chime, but they would, if, if they put the pager on their um, waistband, they would definitely feel the vibration. And so it goes, it, and you can really feel it. It's a pretty heavy vibration so that they would know that somebody within the house um, needed help. And um, all of these I saw on Amazon. 
So using an electric doorbell or electronic doorbell. So it allows the user to press a button and alert goes off on the caregiver's phone. So of course, sorry, I just dropped my phone. Um, but here's my, uh, now I have a ring doorbell, okay? Um, but there's Nest, there's a whole bunch of others, all right? So I press the button and I, I got an alert on my phone that says somebody's at my front door. So um, I could be on another uh, floor and I could get this alert or say I left this part with my loved one and I went to the grocery store and all of a sudden you know I get an alert on my phone there's someone at your front door well that actually just means that there's somebody pressing the button and I can get onto the ring I can see I can then speak to whoever is here so say if I was in a wheelchair and I had set this right here. Person presses the button, I get an alert and I say, hi, what's going on? Okay. And so it says somebody's at my front door. And if I answer correctly, I can, so I can see what's going on. Okay. Um, just another way of being able to communicate. And we get a lot of concerned caregivers who are afraid to leave a person with ALS at home alone, even just to go to the grocery store, um, because they want to make sure that they're okay. So you can physically see somebody through a doorbell. And then using a smart speaker um, is another way that you can um, call for help or let someone know you need something. Um, smart speakers, this is my Amazon Echo Show. You can talk smart speaker to smart speaker. So for example, if I had this in my living room, which is where I'm sitting now, and I have my spot upstairs and say my daughter or son was upstairs, I can call them in between these two smart speakers. I can also use my smart speaker to make a phone call because all smart speakers are synced with either a cell phone or now you can actually um, program your um, Echo devices on a PC. So you don't necessarily need a smart speaker. But mine is hooked up to my smart speaker. And so I'm going to say, Alexa, call mom. I found a contact matching mom in Elisa's contact. Is that who you want to reach? Yes. Calling mom's mobile. Now my mom knows she's getting a phone call. So hopefully she'll answer. Hello. Hi, hi mom. I'm just checking this hi. out for the webinar. Okay, hope it works the right All right, Take thanks. Bye, bye bye. Alexa, hang up. Okay. So any contact that I put into the smart speaker, I can use to call. And just as an aside for people that often ask, what if I can't verbally speak? Well, you can still do the same thing and you just use your communication device or whatever device you're using to speak, whether it's in your smartphone or a tablet, and you say, Alexa, comma, call someone else. As long as it's been linked as a contact, it doesn't matter if it's you verbally speaking or you using your speech generating device, it'll make that phone call for you. So I just wanted to show you the differences in the uh, Echo products right now. Now, Google Home does the same thing. This is a Google Home right here, um, but it's a much smaller sp um, screen. Um, the Echo products now come in five, eight, and 10, and that just means the size of the screen and of course, the cost associated with it. Um, but you can see here how people are, are easily staying connected and making phone calls just through their smart speakers. So this is a new product I found. This is a voice activated life alert. So, you know, you've seen the I fallen and can't get up. Everyone has seen those commercials and you have to press the lanyard. Well, this particular company wanted to go lanyardless. And so now they're using smart speakers, which is just, you know, this is looks like either a Google product or I can't tell if it's Google or Amazon and it does not say on the website. 
Um, and uh, so they've embedded their life alert software into these smart speakers so that if you fall through voice activation, you say, I need help. And it's a monitored service. So when you say, I need help, when you probably give it a trigger word, um, it makes the call for you through the through the smart speaker, you'll say, you'll hear, Mrs. Smith, do you have a problem? Yes, I've fallen, I need you to call so-and-so. Or I need you to call 911. So they come in um, smart speakers that have video here, which you can see, or just, and this looks like an Amazon Echo Dot, which uh, has no video feature and it's just the smart speaker. So this is the traditional uh, life alert, the, the regular I've fallen and can't get up, which is a monitored system, as I just mentioned. Um, it's monitored year round, 24 seven. These do have an installation charge, give or take $80, it depends on where you live across the country, and then a monthly fee, give or take of $50. And so the user wears a transmitter and that transmitter is either around a lanyard um, or now they put them on, uh, you can use them on your wrist here. Um, and obviously if you fall, you activate the pendant. They uh, now, I'm sure you've seen the commercials too, um, have uh, remote buttons for like in the tub so that if you've fallen in the tub that you can press the button. Um, and uh, some of them actually now come with um, fall detection. That's an add-on. So that it will um, activate should it detect that you fell. So a, a lot of my, my people that I work with say to me, well, that's great. These, these are great systems here, but I can't press this button and I, I can't do the rest thing. Um, so then I say, okay, well, what can you do? So uh, the wrist thing, <laughs> the wrist activation, it's not just for using on the wrist. If the client has, um, they have good foot movement, you can actually place that around uh, an ankle and then you can activate it with your foot. So, um, but if they cannot, um, utilize that. There's switch activation. So a switch, I have two of them here. This is a piece of equipment that sends a current to the machine to do something. So um, take, for example, a joystick on a power wheelchair. When you move it, uh, you know, push it forward, the, the switch, which is just a joystick, which is just another version of a switch, sends a current to the machine to do something and it goes forward, back, left, right. Switches do the same thing and they can be used to activate computers or they can also be used to activate a lifeline. So this particular lifeline has a transmitter here and that transmitter goes on the side of a wheelchair or near a table and the switch gets plugged into the transmitter. Then if the person has an emergency, they press the switch. You can put a switch anywhere on the body where there's muscle movement. So I'm hoping you can hear it. Every time that I've done that, I've made an activation. So if I had this one, actually it's called a pillow switch and it has a safety pin in it. Hope you can see that. And so I can put that like in a headrest or an, on a pillow so that I'm sitting here and I'm minding my own business and all of a sudden I, I feel unwell. I hit that and it sends uh, a current to the lifeline and the lifeline activates. And then you'll hear through the intercom, Mrs. Jones, do you have an emergency? Yes, I do. I, I need you to call someone. So they are accessible through various ways, not just with your hands. And that's where uh, I, I hear a lot of people say, well, I don't use it anymore because I can't activate it anymore. 
So switch activation, and that is something you do need to ask the company that's providing the life alert system to you is do they have that specific function, switch activation. Sometimes they don't know what that means. So you have to explain it, <laughs> that um, you know, you're know you working with a, a, a person that doesn't have hand function or arm function or, or leg function, so they need a switch activated life alert. And then there are cell phone activated life alerts. Um, and this is for obviously uh, people who don't have a landline or who are active in the community or still want to be able to go for a walk and know that their lifeline is, um, is functioning and that they can call for help. So these do require a monthly fee. Um, average that I saw online was about $30. You can also add in a GPS feature so that if you were out and about and you fell and you, uh, for example, knocked yourself out and you couldn't articulate where you were, there's a GPS feature that's used in conjunction with that fall feature that will send an emergency alert out to 911. There's a really good article that I found on Consumer Reports and the link is here. And by the way, gosh, I should have started this. I'm sorry, I'm happily send my slides so you don't necessarily need to take notes. Um, if you want my slides, just send me an email. When we're done, my email is on the last um, uh, slide here. But it was a great uh, comparative article on how to choose a medical alert system and it's what by consumer reports and the link is right here. So there are non-monitor alert systems and uh, unfortunately, as you could see, um, my battery is about to expire on my computer. So I am just going to go turn it back on. Not quite sure what happened. No, it's plugged in, but unfortunately, my son knocked the plug out of the wall. <laughs> um, Non-monitored alert systems, these don't have a monthly fee to them. So if you're working with a client that um, either doesn't, uh, can't afford the monthly fee or is not interested in paying for that, you can get these uh, one-time fee emergency alert systems. And what they do is you program numbers in. So uh, say the first number would be my neighbor, Jack. The second number would be my son. Third number is my daughter. Fourth number is my uh, 911, okay? So if I press the button here or here, it activates uh, a dialing system. So if uh, the first person doesn't answer, it goes to the second person. If the second person answers, it's an automatic play message that says, hi, Elisa has depressed her emergency call bell and she needs help, please go to the house. So um, that it's important to understand with all of these systems, not just these non-monitored systems, that it's, it's not 911 that's always dialed first. You choose who is dialed first. I have a lot of uh, folks that I work with that say, well, I don't want this system because I don't want 911 bothered all the time. Well. That's not the case. You choose uh, for monitored and non-monitored systems who is going to get called first. And then the Apple Watch 4, which I'm wearing now, um, and I, the 5 is out now too. So it has built-in fall detection. So what happens is the watch detects a hard fall and then what it'll do, it starts hapticking. A haptic is a buzz against your wrist. Um, and now I've owned this watch for about an hour, a year and a half, and I've had it actually go off twice. It was an accident. Um, they thought I fell. Um, one time I almost fell, uh, but I didn't. But it said, Elisa, are you okay? And I answer, yes. If I don't answer, um, it will send a notice to 911 along with my GPS coordinates um, so that help will be on the way. But you do have to answer it, yes, I'm okay, or no, I'm not. And you have a time limit of how long uh, the watch will wait. Um, it's 
about a minute before um, it starts dialing for you. Um, some, some people are just more comfortable. Like for me, I, I necessarily wouldn't want to wear a lanyard around my neck or, or have something um, that wasn't a watch on me. So I feel like I have uh, a little bit of peace of mind that I know if I fall that um, my watch is looking out for me. And then you can also use your cell phone, obviously, to call for help. But a lot of people will say, well, I'm really having trouble. I'm dialing or I, uh, I, I can't swipe. So uh, both um, the Android products and the Apple products have, um, have voice recognition built into them for to do several things. Um, you can use it as simple as uh, just using it to send a text message or to make a phone call. So on the Apple phone here, it's, it's Hey Siri. So I say, Hey Siri, let's see, she came up. Send a text. Yes. Send a text. Who do you want to send it to? Olivia Brownlee. What do you want to say? I hope you're doing your schoolwork. Your message to Olivia Brownlee says, I hope you're doing your schoolwork. Ready to send it? Yes. Okay, it's sent. And so I didn't have to touch that. So I could have used that to make a phone call too, to tell her that I needed help. Um, the same with your Android. Um, on, on Android, it's okay, Google. Um, for the Apple products, that what I just did is called Hey Siri. You have to go in under settings and go to Siri and turn on Hey Siri. For your Android devices, you have to download from the Google store, um, OK Google. And now both of these devices now have total access to your cell phone through voice. Um, in Google, it's called Google Voice Access. And here's a screenshot where every icon has a number. So if you say number seven, and number seven opens and then everything here has a number. So if you hit seven, it would open your Wi-Fi. And everything under that would have a number so that you can use all your functions and your features of your Android device through voice access. And then in September, Apple came out with their own voice access uh, feature in, uh, in the when they released iOS 13. So you can tell your phone to go back, to go home. You can instruct the phone to open specific apps, text, you know, zoom in, zoom out. Everything that you can do with your hands, you can now do with your voice on your Apple product. And that includes, of course, making phone calls. But you, you don't have to necessarily activate this feature. You can just activate Hey Siri if you just want to make a phone call or send a text. So this is my uh, contact information. I am happy, as I said, to share my slides with you. And I'm also happy to answer any of your assistive technology questions, not just on what we talked about today, um, but uh, any type of question. And so I just wanted to check the Zoom chat. Yep. Um, and I wanted to ask if there's any specific questions that you had. And I am going to go back. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second and go back. And does anybody have any questions? Because I can unmute people. OK, I am muted. Anybody have questions? guys are a very silent group today. <laughs> um, again, feel free to reach out um, and let me know if you do have other questions. And I'm going to be doing a series of assistive technology webinars. I'm trying to get line up some speakers. So um, I'm just going to keep this going.
Um, I have a question, Alisa. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a couple of therapists that would really be interested in uh, knowing what you shared. Is there a place where you host these webinars once they're recorded? There is, and I will send you the link. I now have a Vimo account. Um, I, I couldn't do it on YouTube because you can't put anything over 15 minutes right now. <laughs> so I have a Vimo account, so I will send you the link, yes. Okay, if there's no other questions, um, I want to thank everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in. And um, you'll be receiving a list of uh, anticipated webinars uh, as soon as I line up all my speakers. But I thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much, Melissa. Bye. Bye.